number 10 and number 12. That would leave items 1, 2 for closed session. Regular items uh, would go 3, 4, 8, and 11. We'll get a concurrence on uh, 5, 6, 7, 10, and 12. And for item 5, uh, is the council file 09-2633, sensitive 23? Yeah. Okay. And then on number 7, uh, what I'd like to do on that is to uh, ask the... Uh, Let's see. Ask the city attorney to get with uh, with the city with the clerk, and give us for the committee report information so we can make a comparison on the amount of outside council funding for 0809 compared to uh, the current year uh, 10 uh, 9 10. Uh, I'd also ask that uh, uh, we ask to uh, add a direction to the city attorney to report to budget and finance in 60 days on a strategy to reduce outside council expenses, including proprietary departments. So if we could move those items. So moved. Okay. okay. Yeah, outside council, yeah, including yeah. proprietary. We'll move those items. We'll go in closed session on item. Let me do this. We have a, a commissioner here. Why don't we ask you to come up and deal with the uh, I miss an appointment before we go in closed session. All right. Item three is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Angela Reddick uh, to the Board of Fire and Police Pensions. Good, Good, Good afternoon. How are you doing? Could you give us just an overview of you've been on other city commissions, but also what your uh, priorities would be on the police fire uh, pension? Uh, as this appointment is uh, by the mayor. Okay. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for allowing me to come before your committee. It's an honor. Um, just by way of a little bit of background about me, I am a lawyer, by, uh, and I practice. I have my own firm. I specialize in employment and labor law, and I do human resources consulting. I've also had a chance to serve in a number of public capacities in the city of L.A. as a member of the Transportation Commission for over six years, um, formerly on the LA Community College Board of Trustees and um, different capacities at the local and state level. I counted, counted an honor that the mayor would ask me to serve on the LA Fire and Police Pension Board. Um, obviously the work of this board and the impact of the pension on our city system is, is very important in that um, we are charged with providing oversight to the pension and making sure that we protect it for the officers that um, support us and work for our safety every day. My number one priority would be to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the pension system and of the fund and um, in my role as a board member to ensure that those that we use to make investments on our behalf are of the um, utmost quality and integrity and that they are committed to the fire and policemen that serve us every day. Um, a second priority would be to ensure that I know the city has done um, an audit of the fire and pension system and um, that recently under the direction of Michael Perez, who's the general manager, there have been a number of disclosure requirements. So I want to make sure that we're holding ourselves to a standard um, to make sure that we are um, have the integrity as board members that we're holding our staff to that same standard and making sure that you as councilmen know and the fire and police officers that we represent know that they can trust us and they can count on us. And then thirdly, obviously making sure that we're making good investments. Um, after all, that's why we're there and um, we're there to preserve the fund and to make sure that we're maximizing it and to make sure that as our fire and police officers prepare to retire that they can count on a good pension fund and to the extent we can tie that to investments locally and encouraging investors to look for opportunities to help grow Los Angeles and grow the economic environment here I would certainly want to to see that as a priority as well uh, thank you very much uh, let the record reflect Mr. Wezar and Mr. Koretz has joined us so we have a full committee uh, let me just ask are you currently sitting as a transportation commissioner I am. Last Thursday, if I'm confirmed before the city council, last Thursday was my last meeting. Okay. And then let me ask the mayor's office, is, uh, maybe if I missed it, but the ethics package uh, is not part of our package. Anybody from the mayor's office? Right. 
Okay. Can we ask uh, for the city clerk if we could make sure that we get the full ethics package before this comes to council? And then also, is there a timeline on this? Actually, uh, it was scheduled for tomorrow, but uh, because the council will be hearing uh, the consideration for the new police chief, Ms. Reddick has been given the option of being approved in absentia or rescheduling for either Wednesday or Friday of next week. Okay. All right. Are you gonna, uh, could you give us an idea if you're going to come tomorrow or would you rather be rescheduled? I will reschedule. Okay. All right, we can get with the clerk before you leave. Okay. But uh, also, by the time it comes to uh, council, we can make sure that we have the uh, full ethics package so uh, full council will be able to review all of the material. Uh, let me just ask a couple of questions. You mentioned in your presentation about the issue of uh, folks that, uh, I guess we call them uh, placement agents, that have uh, certainly uh, the police fire pension uh, has come up with some guidelines on how they're going to deal with it. Uh, what is your awareness of that whole issue? Uh, because uh, I think it took a lot of us by surprise because it started in New York, then went to New Mexico, and then I believe down in down south. What is your awareness and, and the impact of those placement agents on the uh, funds themselves? Well, first let me say I am not uh, a pension fund expert or an investment expert, but I certainly look forward to hitting the ground and to getting a quick education on on these issues. I know what we all know from what we've read in the papers and what we know publicly, and certainly it's an issue that I want to learn more about as it relates to the city of L.A. and how it impacts our pension fund. Okay. Yes, no, um, Ms. Redock, I uh, followed your um, work that you've done on various commissions and at the Community College District, and I think you, no matter what issue it is, whether it's uh, transportation or higher education, you've always approached these issues in a very thoughtful manner, and given your well-rounded experiences, I, I have noticed that whatever new environment you come into, you hit the ground running, and so uh, in this um, Commission, where we have a lot of attention being paid to it. Um, I hope that uh, you do the same as in the past, and I know you will. So thank you for your service, and, um, and welcome. Thank you, Councilman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As I was saying to staff here, I consider you my sister. We've gotten very close <laughs> together over the last five years. Uh, you, you are a constituent of mine, but you're also an amazing, uh, gifted uh, a community spirit who, who gives back a lot in public service and have over the years. I'm just kind of shocked you're the first woman and the first African American on this group. Um, uh, it's all men, and there's two Latinos and, and, and the rest uh, Caucasians. And, and so um, just from a minority standpoint, to be a woman and an African American, thank God that, that you're going to come onto this board. But back to the more serious issues, mm -hmm. which are to do the right investments and to, and to make the things happen. Your opening comment about transparency, it's very clear. We're, we're totally there. There's been all kinds of questions about some of these commissions and some of these boards, especially right now with the down economy and the way everybody's money is very sacred and, and, and people are concerned. Uh, would you give me uh, your reasons for wanting to go on this particular commission uh, and what you think this will mean for us all as a city? Well, uh, thank you, Councilman Rosenthal, my brother from another mother. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I enjoy public service. So first and foremost, this is about um, continuing to have the opportunity to serve a city that I love so much. Um, secondly, when the mayor asked me to consider this appointment, he started off by saying, I know it may not sound that exciting, and I know it's something that may not have been on your radar, but we really need to. And we need um, what we need are people who are committed to the city, people who understand our city, and um, people who will take their job seriously. And I'm just happy to know that he, when he thought of those characteristics, that he thought of me. So um, my desire, I know um, our city is going through a very tough time budget-wise and economic-wise, and a big part of that um, relates directly to our pension and our ability to maintain our pension and to have uh, continue to have one of the top pension fund systems in the country. And so to be a part of that, to have the opportunity to bring a different perspective as someone who is not, you know, um, 
involved or substantially involved or engaged in the financial services or investment bank industry, I think I'll be able to bring um, a perspective from my years of being involved in public service, from my work as a lawyer, and just quite honestly as someone who cares about the city and cares about the, the men and women that serve us every day and to have the opportunity to help protect the work that they do for years and years is really an honor. It's an honor for us to have you, too, and thank, thank you. you so much for stepping to the plate. Thank Appreciate you. It. Well, I'm not sure I have much to add. I think Jose said exactly what I was thinking. You've got a great track record of success in everything that you've done, and I think we should be honored that you're willing to do this and look forward to uh, exceptional service on, on your part. Thank you. Let me say thank you very much, and if you could get with the uh, – Kirk, uh, and get the date so we can have it uh, programmed for the, uh, either this week or next week's council agenda. And so we'll move this forward uh, uh, as recommended of the board to approve your appointment. And uh, we'll ask the mayor's office just to make sure we have the complete package when it comes to council. Thank you, councilman. Thank you to the entire committee. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, adjourn uh, and do the uh, closed session and then back on the regular items. Budget, uh, regular meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee. We have an entire committee here, Mr. Koretz, Mr. Rosenthal, Mr. Weezer, Mr. Smith, and myself, Bernard Parks, as the chair. Uh, do we have to, Ray, say anything about closed session? Okay. No, not in, okay. Uh, let's uh, go to the uh, regular agenda, and uh, we can go to item number four. Four. Yes. All right. Time consuming. Right. This is uh, our um, item four is our second financial status report uh, for the current fiscal year. <clears throat> Melissa Krantz is here to give more information. <clears throat> Hello, Melissa Krantz, Office of the CAO. The uh, second FSR is going to provide an update on the budget deficit and shortfall in revenue. Uh, we provide a four-year outlook on uh, general fund revenue and expenditures. We discuss key issues affecting the city's budget. We make recommendations totaling $90.8 million for budgetary adjustments. And we also make a recommendation to freeze spending in, of the uncommitted balance of overtime accounts within the departments. Uh, the um, report does not discuss departmental surpluses or deficits because we were missing a lot of information with regards to departmental operational plans in terms of their implementation and savings from the recently approved union agreements and the implementation of ERIP. Uh, however, in our operational plan, we presented a budget deficit of $405 million. The second FSR discusses how that deficit's been wheedled down to about $98 million. That includes $73 million in previous savings, including the modified deployment plan and the furlough of EAA employees. We also have uh, $187 million total from the new union agreements with the Coalition of City Unions and the Los Angeles Police Protective League and the implementation of ERIP. And then we have additional savings with uh, regards to health benefits, uh, additional police department savings, and other uh, budget balancing measures that are proposed. Um, revenue figure has not changed since our first FSR. We are projecting a shortfall of $75 million, and that uh, reflects a reduced transfer from the special parking revenue fund of about $36 million and uh, steeper than predicted declines in the hotel and sales tax. 
and a slower growth than expected for the utility users tax. Um, we will know more by our next FSR when we have properties and sales tax information coming in in December. Uh, the reserve fund that we reported, the balance was $133 million in the first FSR. We're now down to $122 million. Uh, the major component of this is an $18.5 million proposed loan uh, to cover liabilities claim settlement. That amount would be repaid if we issue judgment obligation bonds. Um, also reflected in the contingency reserve account is a um, previous council motion for $13 million transfer to the fire department to cover their SRS reduction and we make a recommendation in this report to not do that and that is uh, recommendation number 37. Uh, the four-year outlook is also updated from our previous operational plan. In the operational plan uh, we show the deficit of 405 million. Uh, as we stated it's now 98 million. The 2010-11 uh, budget gap was then reported as 821 million and now we're reporting that as 408 million and it might actually be a little bit lower. We uh, have an evaluation that's going to go forward to the pensions board uh, and the uh, contribution for the pensions may be lower in the following year. But we will update that in the next FSR. We also um, provide an update on our issues of concerns. Uh, we have the liabilities claims account again. Um, Right now we're projecting a deficit as high as 85 million. That if we issue judgment obligation bonds, that would be down to 5 million. Council has only authorized up to 50 million in the judgment obligation bonds, so we would have to come back for council action. And if we did do judgment obligation bonds for all uh, settlements over a million, we'd still have a $5 million shortfall. Uh, we also provided update on the solid waste fee lifeline program, and there's a recommendation in the report to uh, study that right now it's a fee waiver and it's granted to all uh, DWP ratepayers who qualify for their lifeline. Their lifeline program is a reduced billing and we're going to uh, recommend pursuing to see we can bring our uh, fee uh, waiver lifeline in program in line with DWPs and other programs. As I mentioned before, we don't have enough information to discuss the salary depart the department's salary accounts. So that will be discussed in greater detail in our next FSR, but there are uh, called out two uh, liability issues for animal services and the fire department. <coughs> As for the state budget, uh, we have some update on that. Uh, Prop A secure cessation, the bond sale went through. The yield's a little bit higher than expected, 4%, and we expect to get $60 million on January 5th of next year, and then the other 50% of that on uh, May 3rd. Uh, the gas tax, there was recent state action that will allow us to use Prop 1B funds to uh, backfill the gas tax funds. And uh, we, they also updated the schedule that allowed us to get some of our transfers through October. Now uh, future transfers will be delayed till April. And then Prop 42, that transfer will be delayed till May. Uh, with the redevelopment funding shift, uh, the California Redevelopment Association has filed a lawsuit challenging the state's action to hold on to that funding. Um, there was a previous state action to do uh, to capture these funds the previous year and the state has recently abandoned that appeal. Uh, they were they was found to be unconstitutional to seize those funds and we're hoping that a similar argument will have a similar finding before the May transfer. With um, budgetary adjustments and we also have some miscellaneous actions. I'm going to cover the miscellaneous actions first. As I mentioned before, we're uh, recommending to freeze uncommitted balance of department overtime accounts. That's about 28.6 million. And we have several departments here that would like to speak on that, that recommendation. The reason why we're recommending the freeze is to buy some time to, to uh, conduct an analysis before we make a predicted recommendation to transfer funds in our next FSR. And those funds would be uh, transferred to um, the Reserve for Economic Contingencies for other use. Let me, let me just ask you a question on that point. When we say freeze, and then we, I think you use the term ex, in exceptional circumstances or something like that, did we identify what those might be so the departments have better guidance? No. Uh, what our recommendation is uh, only to allow payouts, cash payouts of overtime when it's mandated by the MOU or admin code. So it, what it, it doesn't prevent departments from authorizing overtime, although we're recommending that departments manage, manage their use of overtime. 
um, but it requires that it be banked, and then uh, as employees near their bank that they use their compensated time off rather than using cash payouts. But I think the message you're sending is that in a very short time, any overtime that's not mandated by MOU is going to basically be recommended to be swept. That, it, it, the sweep will, the recommendation will be coming later, yes, but that will be, that's, that's, our, the, that's our intent. That's our direction that's the that we're headed. Sending, that's that if it's not mandatory of the MOU, then it's time and the funds that are there are being frozen to be swept later. We might refine that further to make allowances for um, funds, you know, special funding sources and, and over time with, with regards to fixed post positions. But, you know, that, that will, by recommending the freeze right now, that gives us time to do that analysis to make other exceptions. And the time you're waiting for, is that for FSR 3 or will there be a singular report dealing? It would be for FSR 3. Okay. That would be in January. So, so with that, basically you have MOU provisions that require us to pay over time. There's also, um, when Melissa mentioned the ad code, <clears throat> here again, actually one of those things is retirements. All the folks that actually do retire, we do have to pay them out. Um, so that would be another um, place where we have to make cash payouts. <clears throat> and we know I just we wanted clarity so that as the departments come forward, they'd at least be aware of what the intent was with clarity, as much clarity as we have today. Yes, they will come in and ask for 24-7 operations and grant funds and, and special funds. And, and so we'll be working with the departments on those. I, mean, I think the committee has been pretty clear on the grant fund issue that, you know, we got a couple of departments <coughs> that are reflected in the report that are giving back grant funds. And I don't think anybody had an, an intent during the budget that we'd be giving back grant funds, particularly if we are saving them for artificial reasons and then giving them back. And I think that's something we certainly have to straighten out so that we are, are, are basically uh, serving the public as best we can uh, within the limited resource but not make the pain more harmful just so we can say we balance, we have a balance in the use of the funds. But Correct. I just wanted you to make that clarity because as departments come up, they'll be aware of what direction you, the CAO is going. Yep. Okay. Uh, now, a couple of things that I did want to highlight mm -hmm. um, as Melissa uh, went over the one is the revenue. You know, we in the first FSR we laid out the 75 million, and we provided some additional information. Attachment 1A does uh, include those those updates, and um, we do have, as you can see, we have a lot of minuses on that page. We have a nice big positive with property tax, and we hope that holds as we go through. Uh, we'll see what the collection rate is in the uh, the second part of the year, but certainly during the first part of this year, our receipts are up. However, but we are very concerned certainly with our utility users tax where we're not seeing the growth in the receipts. You know, our, our gas um, has, has been down quite a bit uh, in, in that particular category of uh, UUT. Uh, our license permit fees and fines here again, well, we're projecting we're, we're, we're down about 25 million. Uh, this is through a whole range of things as we look at you know, planning fees and other reimbursements. We have multiple categories. Uh, where we are um, down <clears throat> where we should be uh, in the current year. We're up in business tax right now, and a lot of that had to do with the amnesty program, but it, uh, it remains to be seen as we go forward, you know, when we get the bulk of our receipts uh, in, in January, February, March, and, and April, and that's when we'll get a clearer picture of, of actually where we are with business tax. Sales tax, uh, we're showing at this point we're down about $7 million. But I think we've indicated we could be much higher, could be double that uh, as we go through throughout the year. Uh, this is, here again, we were looking at the last two quarters of being down about 7, 8 percent receipts, but we were down 17, 18 percent, pretty much double uh, what we anticipated in the budget. <clears throat> and as this, as this carries through in the, the later quarters, um, it's going to certainly impact uh, the, our receipts, our annual receipts uh, uh, for the whole year. Doc transfer, we haven't uh, made an um, adjustment thus far, but we're certainly falling behind in our receipts. The, uh, basically, our, our 12 month uh, moving average shows us well under $80 million. Um, we hopefully, you know, things will pick up. You know, we've been, you've been hearing reports uh, that there's been turnover in activity. 
in properties, um, but we haven't seen those actually hit us you know, with our, our delays uh, in our actual receipts. So um, we're hoping the 75 million holds. Um, it could go upwards uh, a little over that um, as we get more data. So I know we stopped your train of thought, but let me just ask uh, Ray hit on item on attachment 1A. Could you, uh, before go back to your notes, just take us through those 11 attachments and highlight things that the committee should be aware of, the things that might be out of sorts or that would be of concern to us? Okay, okay. Ray took you through the uh, revenue figures, and uh, the charts are there to, uh, you know, clarify the revenue figures as reported. So th those are all of attachments 1A through F. Uh, attachment two is the status of the reserve fund, and that includes, um, if you look towards the bottom, the other proposed loans and transfers. That is the where the 13 million for the rec, uh, the fire modified deployment plan is included, and that's the one that our office is recommending against. That also includes um, other recommended loans and transfers that are included in the report. Uh, attachment. And, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm sorry, <laughs> Melissa. And on that, um, one of the reasons that we are recommending to have that motion on fire to be received and filed, um, as you know, we've been talking about um, all these big judgments that have been coming down recently, and, and roughly about 18 million or so has been approved as far as coming from the reserve fund. But there is, we anticipate another large payment to be coming forward before the end of the year. And the only sorts of money we have to borrow at this point will be from reserve fund again. Um, that will take us under the 122 million, which dips into the emergency reserve. So you know, we sort of have this sort of quasi bookkeeping issue with holding the, this motion. Um, I think, as you know, uh, as council knows, we've been working um, with fire with UFLAC on a resolution. Um, I mean, we will see where that goes, um, but um, you know that's sort of on a separate track at this point uh, with our labor negotiations. Uh, given that, um, you know, this is where we number one we need to hold all reserve fund <clears throat> appropriations, and where we are going to borrow for liability uh, claims, um, you know, we need to take a close eye on all these things. We, we anticipate to get reimbursed by JOB sometime later uh, in the year. But we had this discussion last uh, week in committee about the controller needing to borrow fund, funds for their cash flow, but we also have needs uh, to pay these large judgments uh, that may come down the pike. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that, and the reason that motion went to committee was that if I read the report under fires by department, even with their uh, change in deployment, uh, there's still going to be $24 million in the whole with, and it would just add to that deficit by finding another 13 million. So that's, I, I don't pretty well <coughs> support your recommendation. So we can continue on the, uh, the attachments. Uh, is my understanding that the uh, fire deficit includes the 13 million, that 13 million was meant to offset the fire department deficit? Yeah. The, the next attachment, I'll just jump in on this one because this is one that we wanted to, to really um, highlight, you know, that we updated our, our outlook um, for the next four years. Um, we've done a number of things. Um, you know, this is attachment three. This is attachment three. Okay. Back when we put the budget together, we were looking at about a million dollar shortfall for 2010 11. Mm -hmm. It came down on the last FSR to about 800 or so, and you know, Melissa, you can help me with the number. Um, but both lasers and pensions have revised their funding policies. They've, they basically extended the corridor, pension um, reviser, five year, went to seven year smoothing. All those brought some numbers down. <clears throat> we also have a lot, many of the labor agreements that were put into place that have further reduced some of the numbers um, to get where we are now. But what I wanted to highlight is even with all of these things that have happened over the last several months, we're still looking at a, a $400 million shortfall for 2010-11. And you think about the 400. We're struggling with the 400 this year. We'll have the same problem next year. Or even worse, because there'd be no EREP. 
Exactly. Exactly. We we have this is these numbers already account for ERIP happening. Fifty three percent of the ERIP savings are already accounted for here. For this year too. Four hundred million. The four hundred million for this year accounts for the ERIP, but we've already accounted for the savings for next year, two thousand ten, eleven. Okay. So with that, I'll and I think on on the uh, outlook report. I don't know whether we're being uh, in the sense of looking more positive than, but we are projecting that we're going to get some benefits of the change in our revenue that may not be forthcoming. We're, uh, as far as the revenue, I, we have been looking, taking into account some of the changes we're seeing this year. Mm -hmm. So I, but you look at the, the Dow, I closed up again today in the S&P. Um, you know, maybe things are getting better, um, and, and so we hope uh, as we go forward that there will be only upside but, potential. I mean, even though we look at that, uh, those <coughs> changes uh, each day, the thing that I think drives us more than anything else is the unemployment. And when we see that we're at 10 plus percent in the state and we're going to probably recover slower than the rest of the world, well, the city, I, and I can assure you, there are places within the city that may or may be double and in some instances, oh, yeah. triple of the state average. So the folks in having discretionary money to buy, pay sales tax, and all that other stuff, uh, it's going to impact us greatly by unemployment. And, and they keep telling us that we've not hit the peak for foreclosure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and unemployment is still growing. And so I think that, uh, you know, we can adjust as we move forward. I just don't know whether because the Dow closes, we can – Declare victory. Uh, well, you're right. I would not count on you know, we're, because the Dow was up and S&P was up. But that might help our 401ks, but it's not going to help yeah. our bottom line. Yeah. So. Okay. I know we've got uh, attachment four. Okay. Uh, there's two attachments for four. They reflect the uh, UB. You actually should have revised attachment 4B. Um, this reflects council actions to date, and I'll tell you through the revisions. Um, it reflects. Our recommendation 32, uh, there was an action by council with regards to street service positions. Um, these positions were already included in the street services budget. However, uh, there was a motion recently to move funding out of the UB, but since that funding and positions were already parted at the street services budget, that was not required. So this um, table has been updated to reflect that. Also, um, the fire department. Um, Figure was updated for the 280,000 reappropriation. The original one said 200,000, and uh, street lighting maintenance was uh, revised to reflect that the funding was coming from the special fund UB, not the general fund. And then the subsequent attachments uh, through attachment H are transactions that are recommended in the report, and that includes a revised attachment seven. Um, at the request of the council office, we are deleting the recommendation to transfer $3,000 for bringing back Broadway. So, and then beyond that, attachment nine is a just an informational report on the current uncommitted balance of overtime accounts for departments, and that would be the money that we would expect to be frozen until we come back with a recommendation to sweep any funds as determined. Uh, attachment 10 is the employment level report that details the change in staffing. And then the final attachment is attachment 11, which uh, details the latest of the um, fee increases by department. Uh, all fee increases have largely been implemented, save fire, and we do have discussion of fire in the report. Okay, now, have all those ordinances been are in place? Uh, except for, yes, that's correct. Now, now a couple of times in your report you reflect that departments have not been able to implement these fee increases because they don't have the personnel at those been resolved? That is correct. The fire department is going forward with a recommendation to the managed hiring committee to fill four of those positions. So then that, that would be the only department? That would be the only department. That's correct. Well, is there any questions on the, on the yes. attachment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Can you uh, go back and on the bringing back Broadway item? Yes. Can you, uh, we do this one. Can you repeat that again? I, w I was uh, received a request that this was no longer a requested action. 
on which item? Uh, it would be the three thousand dollars for um, DOT. It's Angela the, Bruman. Um, well, I wasn't. I wasn't aware of that. Um, uh, Angela Bruman from the CAO's office. I spoke with your staff earlier today, and um, she had indicated that she had been working with CRA, so that funding had become available through the CRA. Okay. Can we uh, hold that item before we complete this meeting, Mr. Chair, so I could get more information from my staff on that, please? Right. Thank you. So we've gone just quickly um, uh, on item uh, attachment three. It talked about the smoothing at Lasers. And it says five percent. I thought they, uh, five year. I thought they'd gone to seven years as well as public safety. At both. No, um, no, Lasers and Pension Boards adapt, uh, adopted different. Uh, one's five years, the other one's seven years. So Lasers still is at five years. Correct. We're, I, th I thought for sure they said they were going to do that. So they hadn't, hadn't voted on it yet, or they decided not to? Why don't you come to the mic? <laughs> <clears throat> we, I had the discussion with the, uh, your staff earlier, and we were going to go back and verify. We, we know pensions made it, um, but we thought Lasers left it alone. There was some discussion on it, but. Okay. Okay. So you're going to check on it for me? Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll check. check. All right, good. That's good. <clears throat> and then the other question is just um, as we look at the, the, the $75 million shortfall in the revenue stream, and as you talk about the, the market catching up and things, we know those revenues sometimes are downstream from us yet six months to a year. But are we seeing any difference in the slope rate on revenue stream or the continued drop at the same continual rate? I, I can't speak to that. I'm sorry. It, it, it actually kind of de depends. Um, most of them, um, um, we have some, some charts. But with sales tax, unfortunately, it's still going down. And that's when the big slope. This, the slope is, is going down, yes. We're hoping to get a little bit of um, a, what I'll call a little tail of sort of a leveling off, but we haven't seen that just yet. Um, you look at doc transfer. That's what the market is saying as far as retail sales is that it's beginning to flatten. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're still on it. There's still a downward trend, but it's, it's <clears> flattening. Uh, yes, and, and so as we get some more data, because we use our, our sales tax on a three-month delay, we hope to see some of that little, what I'll call movement on the tail to get the flattening out. We look at, you know, attachment 1C, documentary transfer. I mean, that's not, that's still going down, unfortunately. Um, and so we haven't seen any flattening out there. Um, a lot of the other uh, categories, um, gas is still on the way down. Um, the electric is, is on the way up a little bit. Um, unfortunately, we just haven't seen enough movement um, with the categories. <clears throat> Any other questions on the attachments? <laughs> okay. oh, I just had one clarifying question on the <laughs> fire department. You're suggesting that we uh, we take back the 15, the 13 million dollars that we had originally uh, applied to the fire department. Well, there was no formal <clears throat> council action. It was a motion to report back, and we're recommending, based on the status of the reserve fund, that we do not transfer funds to the fire department to cover that. So what, are we talking about uh, something specific as an alternative to, to cover that, either more of the brownouts or negotiations with, uh, with fire personnel? What, I think what, originally it was, what, $52 million? It, it was 52. And they found a plan for 39. Nine. Yes. And right. so the mayor made a proposal to accept the 39, but asked could we look at the reserve fund for the other 13. And we've looked at the reserve fund, and we're down to $1 million in the contingency area. And so the recommendation is that it doesn't appear at this time that we should be moving $13 million out of the reserve fund into their operating budget. Uh, again, that $13 million would reduce the number of hours they'd have to redeploy every day. But the issue is whether, uh, whether we have sufficient funds in the reserve fund to do that. That's correct. Our recommendation is based on the status of the reserve fund. So it's not based on the ability to digest that $13 million in an appropriate way. There, may, there might be no way to do that in theory, and you would recommend it anyway. Well, we have actually have filed, we've gone to the Employee Relations Board, we've filed an impasse um, with UFLAC, and, and so um, that piece is that $13 million is, is sort of on a separate track. It's on the labor track, and we've had discussions in the ERC 
regarding a strategy to deal with the 13. That's what I was trying to clarify. So we're trying to do that through labor and not through further cuts in, in service. That's correct. That's correct. Thank you. Now, the other issue in the report on the fire, mm -hmm. it, I wasn't aware they were late in implementing. I know they had to redeploy because of the fires. There's about a $3 million tab somewhere that they've not reached, will not reach their $39 million. And so we're asking them, what, to go back? To like, see if they can identify other uh, mechanisms to say to reach that thirty nine million. Okay, so that's during the fiscal that's during throughout the fiscal, the fiscal year. year. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Well, right now we project they're gonna be at like thirty six instead of thirty nine. Uh thirty five point three I believe was their estimate for what they would achieve through, through the modified deployment plan. All right. Okay. Any other questions on the attachments? No, uh, and the bringing back bride right item, that's fine. My staff informs me those uh, the need for those funds are being covered by other sources. Okay. So thank you. We're giving back. Right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Can we go through uh, just, uh, we don't have to go individually, but uh, the recommendations uh, start on page um, eight. I, I could give you a brief summary to the recommendations? Yeah, a little, okay. little brief summary and just take us by page rather than individual recommendations. Okay. And if anybody has an item on any of those pages, they can speak up. Some of our, our um, one of our main recommendations is a $45 million transfer from the police department's sworn overtime account to the sworn salaries account. And this is using savings through the um, union agreement with the Los Angeles Police Protective Leave. Um, we also have um, on page 25, is uh, a request for council reapproval of MICLA funds that were included in the uh, adopted budget. This is 8.86 million, and those projects are defined on page 25. And uh, we were not able to identify any other funding sources for these projects. And the fire department did provide, I'm sorry, ITA did provide a uh, schedule for how that money would be used. And our debt group did a review and say that it was okay for inclusion in the report. We also have, um, among our transfers, we have 15.3 million in MICLA front funding that is recommended for transfer to street services. And this is front funding for the ARA projects, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act projects. There's additional MICLA funding provided to GSD and ITA and this is prior year funds that total 584,000. And we also have 280,000, as I mentioned before, transferred from the UB to the fire department for um, purchase for the new facility. And we have other miscellaneous transactions, including um, two rescinded recommendations. Colleagues, uh, the recommendations go from page 8 through page uh, 15. Any questions on the, any of the recommendations? Yeah, on the police department, um, are there any un mm -hmm. Do we know that all the bills are in now for the move from the old Parker Center to the new administration building? They have not completed their moves. They'll be completing their move December 15th of this year. So we haven't seen anything that's bubbling up yet. Uh, I'm not too clear on the details of that, but they should have received. They had some purchases that were um, implemented last year. That's where the recommendation is for reappropriation of funds. Um, but I don't know how much um, is coming in for this year in terms of what yes. still needs to be completed. In fact, Ms. Perry did a motion, I think our last council day, asking for the CAO to tell us uh, when and how the last day of operation at Parker Center and what the cost are is so they can have an idea when that building will no longer be on the paper. Well, Parker Center uh, still is housing the Scientific Investigation we, Division, yeah, so that will be at least a couple of years well, until we find some other that's, location. We, that's not a good answer. But the, <laughs> the, the thing is, is that uh, they have uh, the lab and also, I think, the jail, and so they, we're looking at when can we expect that we're not spending any more money operating that building with okay. all the other buildings? And I think her motion was either last Wednesday or okay. Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay, any other questions? Any, any yeah, just uh, the recommendations? Uh, on 32, which is on page 13, uh, this is the one-stop shop, uh, as we're saying, for special events. Yes, that was the recommendation that uh, Street Services actually has that funding and those positions already. So they have it? They have it. Mm -hmm. You Correct. don't have to worry about it? Don't have to worry about it. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And so any questions on the recommendations? Okay. And then uh, if you could take us just very briefly through the departments that start on, uh, what, page 18 or so? Or 17. 
If there's nothing of significance, you don't have you can just move on. But if there, just highlight where what you think. Okay. Well, um, as I mentioned before, we didn't have information available for uh, analysts to, or departments to come forward with uh, specifics with regards to departmental. Uh, deficits or surpluses. So uh, what you have are non-figures. You have whether they're projecting a surplus or deficit. And um, we hope to provide you with greater detail uh, next financial status report. Um, the one I'd like to bring you, uh, the first one, aging, mm -hmm. that issue that deals with grants and not in returning funds, we just need to see. And I think there's a couple of those that, uh, okay. that we need to see how we can uh, primarily turn that around and not return right. grant funds. Aging is typical of a lot of special funded departments um, that any kind of savings that we realize will not benefit the general fund. And if since it's grant fund, uh, it would be returned to the grantor usually the next fiscal year. Um, yeah, I think and, we're trying to avoid that. And we would, and we would try to avoid it, which is why um, uh, aging has been trying to go through the manage hiring process to fill positions. So I think there's a couple, but that's the one I'm concerned with is that we not return grant funds unnecessarily. And again, we realize it doesn't help the general fund, but it doesn't help the public if we are sending money back on grants that we could be using. That is correct, and that's why we try to highlight any issues where we be, suspect that we'd be giving back funds. Okay. Yes, I'm Matthias Markman here for CAO. Um, we are looking at the grants as well just to make sure that they're full cost recovery. That that's right. And that's something that the Managed Hiring Committee is looking at Very as good. well. Right. So as we go through the department, any other highlights of departments? Oh, um, animal services will be is expecting higher than expected revenue with regards to a fee increase. And we also mentioned earlier that this, um, an issue with uh, salary liability as an issue of concern. Uh, building and safety uh, would be able to meet their deficit, assuming they uh, Realize the revenue through their enterprise fund, um, but that would also include layoffs and furloughs. And their new fees, are, are they now operational? I'm sorry? Their new fees, are they now operational? You know, that I don't know. Tyler Monhall, CAO. The fee increases were implemented October 21st. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Let me just ask on page 18. Uh, I just realize you don't have the specifics, but do we have any idea what the shortfall is in the city attorney's office? Because I heard that that's one of those that's in double digits. The uh, well, with the operational plan in place, the uh, city attorney would have a deficit of 13 million. Ida Rubio with the CAO's office. The, um, the city attorney's budget deficit prior to their operational plan was about $15 million. They did uh, reduce that down to about $569,000. However, that included significant staff reductions. They will be revising their operational plan. Um, so their initial plan cut 15 down to 500,000? Yes. But they're going to come back with another. They will be. Um, they will have some layoffs. Uh, not layoffs. They will have some um, ERIP uh, reductions. Okay. Right now, they've reported about seven, 78 employees that have applied for ERIP. So we do not know what the um, estimated savings from that will be. But they will be submitting a revised operational plan. Thank you. Any other highlights? Okay. Uh, city clerk is uh, facing a potential deficit in their salaries general account with the implementation of the operational plan. Uh, community development is not predicting a surplus or deficit at this time. There are actions recommend recommended for that department. The controller's office is projecting a deficit, and they've reported um, impact to their workload with the EA furloughs. Convention Center has uh, reported that revenue projections will decrease, and they're citing the economy on that. Okay. The, the other issue with them, are, are we getting also a reduction 
in expenditures that will match the decrease in revenue? We are getting a reduction in expenditures, but not at a matching level yet, sir. Okay. Uh, Philip Hill, Assistant General Manager. Good afternoon. Yeah, because one of our goals, I think we've talked about in the Budget Committee, is to uh, have convention center within their own resources other than debt service on the building so that they're not on the general fund. And so that's whatever effort can be made during the year, it'd be uh, certainly appreciated by the committee that we not end up with having to subsidize uh, convention center. You can be assured we will do everything in our power plus a little bit more. A couple of things, if I may note, please. Um, we are requesting an exemption from the um, from the request uh, regarding overtime as, as far as not utilizing that. The convention center sells two primary things. That is space and services, and we do have a contractual obligation to sell those services. Um, in our normal operating model, we even require having to use overtime. Currently, we're at 25 percent vacancy. Projections are 41 percent following ERIP. So we actually do not have a way to run the convention center without a targeted use of overtime. The great part about that is all of those services are revenue generating, so the client does pay us for that. But it's a normal part of how we operate the convention center. We need you to get with the CAO on that so that you can talk that out so they'll ha everybody has a clear understanding. And I think you have a couple of other items that are hanging somewhere in the system? Yes, we do, like the um, uh, currently the flexible demand-based pricing will be uh, heard in TCT this coming Wednesday, plus a few more things that are critical, the market and incentive. And really, we're talking with the CEO now about identifying as a team what is the minimum requirement to run a center, like what positions. Um, we are so close to being staffed at a point we're unable to run the center that it really will take a, a team discussion now to say, really, here is the minimum you can even think of going down to to be able to provide services. For example, we're now entering Microsoft Product <coughs> Development Corporation, followed by Auto Show, and I just came off of uh, pharmaceutical scientists, people that make the drugs, lots of people with each show, lots of revenue opportunity. We have to be able to support and run the convention center on a near 24-hour basis to generate revenue, and we do generate revenue off of it. So we will employ every uh, everything we know how to do, and we believe we can work through this process, but we will really need your help to some of the procedural and administrative items. But you said flexible pricing will go before the Tourism Committee? This coming Wednesday, okay, sir. Now, where is the other issue that deals with, I think you were talking a while back, on bonuses or something? The market incentive, being able to really incentivize our marketing team to be able to book into low demand periods or especially lucrative uh, clients like, let's say, your, your medical associations, those kind of items. Uh, that is currently with the CEO. We've had no movement yet. Okay. But we, we would like to move that forward. It's an important part of the process. All right. If you give it the CAO on the issue of your overtime, and then uh, hopefully uh, we can get the flexible pricing out of committee, and then we'll ask the CAO to uh, put some emphasis on this incentive program so that we can get that also uh, before the committee. Thank you, sir. One more item, if I may. Um, the begin. It now. Oh, was that, please? <laughs> You're stretching it now. Okay. <laughs> I'll keep it extra short, okay. sir. One thing we're beginning to look at, which may pay huge dividends in the next few years, is simply the discussion of not discounting the center all the way to zero dollars or one dollar. We are not a broken product. We're a valued entity with LA Live next to us. So the idea of a client not paying a dollar but maybe paying down to 25 cents on the dollar if you want to attract, something I'd like to bring up later in committee. But it would have huge benefits to the city of LA. Okay, you need to bring that to us so we can discuss this. Everybody has a, a clear idea of what that, uh, all of the intangibles. Yeah, let, let me just ask you about the ERIP. How are you impacted by it? Uh, significantly, sir. Right now, um, based on the numbers we have, our full time, we're down 25 percent as we stand at this exact moment in our staffing. Our projections are 41 percent based on the ERIP list that I have received. We'll be down 41 percent in our staffing, sir. Uh, so that's 25 percent, and then a few percent. Uh, then additional to raise us up to a total of 41 percent upon ERIP within the next six months, sir. Uh -huh. And um, uh, that therefore means the overtime picks up? Unfortunately, sir, yes. Yes. 
even banking hours doesn't work for us because it delays it creates a huge problem just weeks down the road so banking hours is unsuccessful for our operation we've got huge programs in progress in the last couple of years you've been in the black and we want to stay there sir and are you comfortable that in this world of that you will I'm not comfortable with that at this point, sir. Our, our sister convention centers across the nation are showing declines in the area of 25 percent, primarily due to contraction. Sure. Clients have less people, want less services, have less parking. And so a lot of our work now is how can we be as efficient as possible, really work on the local and regional markets, and being able to push the filming and the clients that don't have to travel far because they've reduced their travel budgets also. And you said you're coming before the TCT uh, on Wednesday, sir. Wednesday. And yes, what's sir. the item before us? Uh, that one will be the flexible demand pace pricing, a key part to us moving forward on um, being able to fill any kind of vacant space or un un underutilized space. Right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Council Member, did you want to have the departments come up and express any concerns about overtime as we go through that? Because we've skipped a couple of departments who said they had concerns okay, about. If we, if we can go back and capture them. Uh, we had budget and safety mentioned they had concerns. And building safety, sorry. <laughs> uh, they had concerns about the overtime use in the clerk's office, had concerns about the overtime use. Anyone here from the clerk's office of building and safety? Good afternoon. I'm Holly Walcott with the Office of the City Clerk. Our only concern about overtime is our elections. Um, we have the CD2 uh, runoff in December. We also st will start our 89 Neighborhood Council elections. Um, we start the filing in early uh, December for the first round. So we're actually probably okay with them being frozen, but I do want to lay it on the table that before they're swept, um, that we have an opportunity if we have any um, problems to come back and address you at that time. You know, let me just say for those who have concerns about overtime, my standard answer is going to be to get with the CAO and see how you yeah. can work that out in the process. And then as this thing keeps evolving, we're going to be making adjustments and such. But uh, the thing, I think all of you have some concerns or issues. I don't think we can resolve any of them today. But we ask you to get with the CAO and bring up your particular needs. But Holly, Holly, didn't we account for the budget in the budget for the special election? Yes, yeah. the, the funds are there, but they're freezing them. <laughs> okay, so they're freezing in the UB as well as... Oh, no, the, 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 the special election funds have been moved into our account. They were moved in, so now they're going to... To the various account, but anything that's in um, overtime accounts are, are frozen. All right, so we hold the election results until 2011. <laughs> <laughs> we would just ask that some folks can bank the overtime instead of paying the cash. Give it and we take it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, cultural affairs is one of the departments where they have a special fund surplus that we would lose funding for if we do not. Uh, El Pueblo, uh, they had concerns about overtime. And then also cultural, you're going to look at them regarding the grants. That's correct. Good afternoon, and I realize that uh, we'll be working this out with the CEO's <laughs> office. Um, Robert Andrade, the general manager, just want to go on the record that our overtime is a uh, significant portion of our overtime is actually funded by uh, production companies, filming companies, etc. A freeze on this means a freeze on revenue. Thank you. That makes sense. <laughs> and we want to thank pointed. you for that uh, repayment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, but we could give kudos to El Pueblo for actually repaying part of the reserve fund loan. That's what I mean. That's, that's yeah. great. One of the few that paid their bill. <laughs> 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 okay. Mark that down. <laughs> we like that. Got another month. Uh, emergency management uh, is coordinating with the county to sponsor swine flu clinics. And that would be a reimbursement for not only EMD, but uh, Rec and Parks, police, fire, potentially transportation, GSD. Hi. Hello, Myra Pachowski with Emergency Management Department. And we will be hosting, we actually started hosting flu pod clinics last month, and we will be hosting them through no December 20th. 
And we have a signed contract with the county where they will reimburse the City of Los Angeles up to $6,000 per clinic, per site. And so the participating departments such as EMD, Recreation and Parks, GSD, um, and police will receive reimbursement for their services, but this will also involve overtime because, you know, especially for rec recreation and parks and emergency management, we've got to bring folks in on the weekends. So we are going to request an exemption to the overtime freeze, um, especially since we will be reimbursed for these expenses. And again, I mean, uh, the overtime, it, the department, they'll still be able to right. use overtime. It's just that they'll need a bank the overtime and then you know work towards then on the when they have a down cycle on the work then then they would take CTO as, a, as opposed to paying out cash time and a half they would take CTO time off you know time and a half and it, what it comes down to is paying the employee you know 2,000 hours a year as opposed to paying the 2,000 straight time and on top of that paying cash overtime on top of that and, and it's all about just uh, being in compliance with the, the policy approved by mayor and council with the new labor agreements uh, with police sworn and also with the coalition that the, the banks were increased for that reason is to allow for more flexibility where you'd be able to bank the time up front and then work towards uh, working that down through uh, use of CTO. Yeah. I think, again, you talk with them in the stores and look at whether I know that convention center had a unique circumstance that they believe over uh, banking time may not help them. Those are the kind of things they need to see just how they can make sure there's something done specifically for your department if there's ability to do that. Okay. okay. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ethics Department was projecting a deficit in their salaries general counts. Finance was projecting a shortfall in the salaries general count. Fire Department is projecting one of our larger deficits. Uh, we discussed about the recommendation for them to identify additional savings to make up for the shortfall in the modified deployment plan. Now, does that change the 24 if the 13 is a part of that in your recommendation? 32 says we're not. This ref this reflects the shortfall right now. Okay, I mean, but but in, I understood earlier that that included the 13. That was part of that motion. That's correct. Okay, so if we're not going to support that motion, does that drop their 24 down? No, no, I'm sorry. Okay, they were the 24, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. The 24 reflects, uh, assumes that there's no $13 million transfer. There is not. There is not a transfer. So it's not included. It's not included. But it does reflect the shortfall of the $39 million modified deployment plan. They were projecting at the time they made this estimate that they would realize $35.3 million. Okay. Very good. All right. I misunderstood. I think we mentioned it earlier. I thought you said it included. I probably did. Yeah. Don Frazier, uh, Fire. I'd uh, like to uh, speak to the overtime issue. Uh, we will work it out with uh, CAO, but um, uh, working uh, for compensated time off uh, affects the uh, maintenance section uh, adversely. Uh, we don't have a slack period. Uh, right now, uh, we have a 25% uh, vacancy factor. After ERIP, we're going to climb up to 32%. Last year, we used uh, uh, overtime to fill uh, 20, uh, 23 of the positions of the 30 positions that are vacant. And at that, we are still losing ground. Uh, we recently uh, uh, were unable to uh, put fire trucks, uh, air ladder trucks on service because we have a and are you including in that service your radios and everything else? Uh, or is that another, is that another hit? The, the radios uh, are uh, ITA. Okay, I mean, but the issue is that with their cutback in personnel, when you say service, you're talking about keeping the trucks running. Right. I'm asking, have you included in there the radios and other things that do be impacted? Well, that does not include the radios. So um, we see this as significant. Uh, uh, if we can't work this out if there is no overtime, then we'll put companies out of service uh, for lack of a uh, fire truck. Okay. Well, you need to be back to us well before you get to that point, because I think we've supported the, the, the hiring plan as it is. If it begins to deteriorate from that point, we need to know so we can make a conscious decision about it as opposed to finding out later that it occurred. Okay. And, and on, I was looking at the, the dollar amounts, $512,000 on uh, reimbursement from the station fire. 
the mutual aid agreements my understanding is that money goes into the general fund not back to the department over time accounts that correct that's correct and then the funding would be realized the next fiscal year the funding would come in next fiscal year the problem is it doesn't come into the department and that's always been a concern members of council I have a I have a motion in saying when you have a mutual aid situation that's something out of the fire department's control they have no control whatsoever about that expenditure of overtime and yet when the reimbursements come back the city general fund gets the money not the departments so you're forcing them by mutual aid agreements to be out of compliance on overtime uh and some they cannot control whatever so I just want you to keep that in mind because I have a motion on this that we need to really say to PD and FD that when you have mutual aid issues before you that we must put that money back into their accounts because it's not their fault and they shouldn't be hit for it. So, yes, and, and we do work with departments in other instances when the funding is received in the same fiscal year as yeah. when it's expended. Then you will see sometimes in the in the FSR transfers from those re recognizing them as additional revenues and then transferring to the department. But when you get in a situation where the revenue is coming in a different fiscal year, then yes, we do need to work with the department to resolve that. Thank you. I, I got a good one. Yeah, just just want to reconfirm the modified deployment plan. Uh, when we have a red flag day, uh, and I want to specifically say in the Palisades that we had that community meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, will we drop the modified deployment plan on a red flag day if it's going to impact in, in our neighborhoods uh, uh, the condition of the brush? Councilman, the answer is yes. Uh, we had uh, red flag days uh, several weeks back. We suspended the modified coverage plan for those days and staffed up to our uh, uh, pre-budget crisis level. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about my mountain areas. Well, it, it costs the department approximately 125000 each time we do that. Yeah. And so that puts us in a, a budgetary uh, uh, a squeeze. But uh, at this point in time, we would cover and worry about the money after. Okay, now, Mr. Park's earlier question about the $13 million, which was supposed to have been part of this initial shared sacrifice business, uh, you're basically saying it's difficult for you to find that $13 million? Yes, sir. Okay. That's, that's, that's just one. It, it, to find that additional money would uh, require additional closures. Yeah. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, General Services reporting a budget shortfall, and they also are highlighting an issue with uh, funding for new facilities. Right now, they've been um, making use of their existing um, funding to cover the opening of new facilities, but they may be coming back uh, with a request for funds that are currently in the UB. There's also a recommendation uh, for departments to return vehicles that were identified for inventory reduction to the Department of General Services. You know, I was gonna, when I saw that. Should we make that a, a request that the mayor directs if we're not getting support of the departments voluntarily complying? That he directs general managers okay. to return the thousand vehicles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We just wanted to, I mean, because I think we've asked this when they first came up with the plan. And there's a thousand vehicles they're not coming back to motor transport uh, rather than uh, we suggest we need to ask the, the mayor's office request the mayor's office to direct general managers to comply with I believe it's the mayor's directive about getting rid of vehicles uh, Ben to have with the mayor's office uh, we we have uh, been working with departments and, and trying to make sure that we um, you know follow through with the original direction from the mayor's office and we'll continue to do so Diana Mangiolu, CAO. We we also wanted to include it in the report just because it's it is something the fact that departments um, are not returning <coughs> their vehicles at the rate that we were that the budget expects it is impacting general services. Oh, no, we agree budget, with you. So. The issue that's why we want to make sure it's highlighted uh, that we give it as much emphasis as possible so it's not viewed by general managers that it's voluntary. We'd like right. to request that they comply with the mayor's directive. And then let me ask you on, on general services, mm -hmm. petrol and all that, where are we? Because that's so volatile. How are we doing on that? I, I cannot speak to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Good afternoon. Val Maloff, Department of General Services. I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? I was just wondering where are we on our uh, petroleum account and all that because it's so volatile each year. And even though we're talking about reducing the fleet, uh, where are we in the sense of being able to stay well, above uh, like the Like I say, it's volatile and we've only um, – we're at this point we're projecting a deficit of about three million dollars and i believe there's still four million dollars in the ub um, that was set aside in the adopted budget uh, in contemplation of a problem like this let me ask you and I, and I think we've asked this before have we recently gone to the county and other places to see whether we have a better deal on purchasing petroleum collectively versus each individual the reason I bring that up again is that I ran into Bill Fujioka recently, and he said that's what they're going to start doing. I said, well, I think we've done that before, but the answer, I think, always comes back. It doesn't seem like we are really coming up with a better deal. Let me uh, look into that and get, get that information back to you. Okay. Very good. I appreciate it. Okay. Things like MTA, school district, county, it would have seen with that pool that it, and, and I don't, I'm not saying go into that, what do they call it, the hedge fund thing? Yeah. No, the purchase of petroleum. I so, understand what you're okay. saying. All right. Okay. Sorry. Um, All right, the Housing sir, Department is predicting uh, a sir, special fund. Oh, oh, actually, just one more. We did look into actually trying to do some joint purchases of fuel with the county. And I think we went through a review process uh, with GSD. We sat down, we had multiple meetings with GSD staff and the county. And actually, it turned out we wouldn't. We just the pool wasn't big enough, and we actually didn't feel we were going to actually save any money. Okay. That's what I told him, but he said they were going to try to go with school district, and I think MBA yeah. and, and that, that might be the next step. Then is then try to get a larger. Thank you. Housing was one of the departments predicting a special fund surplus where we'd have to watch and make sure that we didn't uh, lose grant funds. They also wanted to speak on the use of overtime. Okay. Good afternoon. Rennie Gardner. Rennie Gardner with the Housing Department. Just very briefly, the Housing Department is a special fee and grant funded department. The primary need for overtime is in our revenue generating units, our bill collecting units, and our accounting units. So we would urge flexibility in the use of cash payments to properly incentivize staff uh, for overtime. Um, and we look forward to the discussion with the CAO on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Makes sense. Dollars and cents. <laughs> uh, Human Services Department uh, was projecting a deficit in their salaries general account. Um, ITA is projected to have a significant deficit, and this is where the discussion is on the uh, MICLA projects for approval. Okay, let me ask you, go one step back on, in, on the Human Services. Yes. Uh, any sense of where we are on, I think, in January, they're supposed to be reevaluating with disability and aging. Is that still in the mix? Good afternoon, Council Members. Madeline Rackley with the CAO. I am the person who is responsible for preparing that report. I have met with the commissions of the three departments involved, and I am uh, in the middle of preparing that report, and I still anticipate that it will be ready for you by January. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Uh, personnel department is projecting a significant budget shortfall by year end. Um, planning department is projecting a general fund surplus in its uh, salaries, but a special fund deficit, so it will result with a net deficit. Uh, police department has a large budget deficit, and that's where we have the recommendation to transfer 45 million. And they also had a concern about overtime. Laura Filatov, Fiscal Operations Division, Police Department. Our concern on the civilian overtime is that um, besides the grant funded, we also have a number of fixed post positions where we um, it makes more sense for us operationally to pay those people on overtime to work rather than to have them uh, accumulate time because it creates just an escalating problem where they have time off and then we have to backfill on overtime. So I know we need to work with the, with the CAO on coming up with some kind of a plan 
but in the meantime we need to um, these these um, issues that haven't gone away so we need to be able to continue our current practice and we have been cutting back on the amount of civilian overtime that's being allocated out to the divisions but for our fixed post 24 7 operations and our grant funded we need to continue to be able to pay those um, folks in cash Zimmer for sworn no we're talking about civilians, civilians. okay the, the now what did we do on civilian overtime in the police department? Is that been cut back? Uh, it's all civilian overtime, including the police department's civilian overtime, is recommended for uh, freezing their expenditures. Okay. Yeah. We'll get with the CAO and, and give them your unique issue. Is it by specific divisions or civilians in general? No, it's specific divisions, the 24-7 operations, the grant funding. The funded, jail or something like that. The jail, um, the PSRs, okay. we have specific, and R&I. So we want to be able to um, continue um, and not have a lapse, a period of time where there's a lapse where we're in negotiation. We really need to be able to continue to have those people work overtime. We're, we're low already, and so there is a, a number of, amount of overtime that is already being used. All right. We'll get with those specific issues and get them to CAO so they can evaluate them in, as they create FSR 3. Okay. And I, I, Thank you. Uh, the next department that's uh, projecting a deficit is CONAD, but it is in their transportation account, and there is a transfer recommended. Uh, engineering is uh, projecting a surplus, largely due to the EAA furloughs. Uh, sanitation is projecting a surplus, but as a special fund surplus that can only be used for special purposes. Let me ask you about sanitation. You're, you're talking about taking some of their... Uh, special fund over over time, which really you can't take for the general fund. So right. why scoop up overtime in the special fund account for sanitation? Uh, right now we're not projecting a sweep. It's only a freeze in overtime expenditures. And, of course, we would look at the funding source to determine whether that would be relevant. Just the direction right now is a blanket direction for all departments. Okay. So you're going to go back and look at them specifically That's because... Correct. They're not the same as every other part of it, so, yeah. Uh, street lighting does not project a deficit. However, they did want to speak on the overtime. Good afternoon. Uh, Norma Sahakian with the Bureau of Street Lighting. Uh, we did have a concern about freezing our overtime. We are 100% special funded. Um, and any Department? A Bureau of Street Lighting. Street lighting. And currently we're using our overtime uh, to facilitate our LED energy efficiency program. And utilizing the banking of the hours really doesn't work because we currently have a 25% uh, vacancy in our field staff. So banking hours and using them later really impacts our maintenance of our street lighting system. So we just wanted to um, voice our concern that we would like to continue to use the overtime. If the report goes forward as is, we would probably be down a couple months in our LED energy efficiency program while we work out um, for the next FSR. Um. And again, I mean, it, it's to the, with the department working with the CAO. I mean, if of course, if, if they need to continue using overtime at that time, we we just it'd be an agreement that okay, just keep on working and bank it for now, and then we'll come back in January and recommend that you keep your overtime, and then at that time you would pay out the cash. So right now we're just asking for a delay in the cash payout. Uh, we will work with the departments if it works out where it does make sense for them to continue working overtime. And at that time, they would just keep on banking the overtime with already the understanding that the CEO will come back and recommend that they be allowed to then implement the cash payout. And that would be in January. But we just need a view. What, I mean, with a special funded department, what does it matter? It, it does not. Uh, you mentioned sanitation. Some of the special funds aren't in the same condition they were a few years back. Some of them are reporting that they are having issues in collecting revenue. Um, so and that's what we're also looking at. That, that there have been some special funds that, that they have seen a decline in their revenue. That's a different argument. And we just want to make sure that uh, they're sustainable, that they're going to be able to pay out their full overhead reimbursements to the general fund. So if you're finding that the department is sustainable, what they're doing is the right thing to do, you can let them continue doing it. Yes, exactly. Okay. I mean, with them, they're, A, they're special fund, and B, the installation of these LEDs is saving us huge amounts of money on a go-forward basis. So it would be kind of penny-wise and pound-foolish to do it. And I agree fully, yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll do the best we can. <laughs> Thank you. Put some light on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we, street services, we discussed the recommendations for the $15.3 in our transfer and the uh, rescinded recommendation. 
Uh, Rec and Parks is uh, projecting a shortfall in their revenues. Um, some of this is seasonal due to the temperatures during the summer. Transportation was reporting a um, issue with. Advises me next year there'll be an overage because they want to pay their water bill. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> transportation, there was a um, report in the first FSR that their salaries overtime account would be depleted, but council has since taken action to uh, replenish some of those funding. And uh, they had, um, they are one of the few departments that actually have MOU mandated cash overtime payouts. Let me ask you, did, uh, now that we have uh, the subsidy accounts, we need to monitor them because we've exhausted their overtime in three months. And now with the subsidy issue, whether they're able to survive between now and June 30th. That's correct. It, it seems to be more of an issue of cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for uh, Treasurer, we have a recommendation that there is no uh, reportage of shortfalls. Uh, Zoo is uh, projecting a 1.2 million revenue shortfall, and that is it for our department balance. Mm. Uh, but is that primarily uh, the salary account? I mean, with the zoo. Uh, zoo was from revenue from ticket sales. They're projecting. Uh, Passes down. Uh, yes. Is somebody from the zoo here? I believe it was tied to a parking lot improvement. That's my big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I want to not only improve the parking lot, but charge for parking. <laughs> Um, I don't know how that was remedied. I know there was some issue about uh, there was a deed for how the Griffith Park was. Yeah. Could we get a report back on that parking? Okay. I think we can charge for parking there and take their revenue. Okay. All right. We've covered, uh, colleagues, the uh, each department. Uh, is there anything in the uh, special funds uh, that you need to highlight or bring to our attention? Okay. Let me say, uh, if we move this item to uh, council, uh, we need to address the uh, uh, issue of uh, Mr. Smith asked for some information back on that quarter issue and then uh, the mutual aid issue that we uh, certainly uh, need a report back on. I think we've asked for that several times. Smoothing. Okay. And actually, we did verify the uh, Lacers did not change their smoothing policy. They stuck with the five years. They felt by uh, in looking at both the corridor, the expansion, and the the smoothing net, uh, it was uh, is only beneficial at this time to basically change the corridor. And their corridor is larger. The point. <laughs> <laughs> their corridor is larger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I understand the corridor is a little larger, yeah. sure. But uh, I mean, the the whole point of this is you get a one year bang out of it, and then it stabilizes. Right. So that's the idea we need. <laughs> Whatever. Well, Thank you very much. Okay. We'll move that item with those uh, comments that we've made, and we'll look forward to FSR 3. Yes, mm -hmm. in a week. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, may I ask um, the, the clerk, do we anticipate next week for this going to council? <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> okay. Tuesday. Okay. All right. Mr. Smith wanted it Wednesday with the uh, everything else. Tomorrow. If we get high up here, it won't matter. Next item. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that should take us to item number eight, which is a board of review uh, report relative to delinquent accounts receivables of a thousand dollars and over. I believe we have someone from the Office of Finance. This is one thing that deletes. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm uh, Jeffrey Whitmore from the Office of Finance. I will point out I'm here uh, in a support role as this uh, comes from the Office of the uh, Controller. Okay. Let me just ask, was this report done after, I think, the, we made the recommendation that these you have the authority over 5,000, so this was done before that? Uh, correct, as the, the it was passed but had not gone into effect. Okay. All right. Let me just ask a, a couple of things. One of the things that, and there's been so much conversation about our better collection processes, is that the concern I have when we go through these is some of these are 10 years old, 
and you get a sense that they're not being monitored or uh, pushed through the system as timely as they should be, even though a thousand dollars isn't a lot of money, but when you have 600 of them and it becomes a couple of million dollars, it appears that we just don't have our arms around uh, getting this stuff through the system as quickly as possible. Uh, the one thing, uh, uh, again, it's not all in your hands. The departments have to cooperate with you. Uh, then we have the, if I understand it, we then come to you. You try to get this collection. It then goes to the outside vendor. They try to get it. And then if it's something that uh, goes, and I, I think eventually we'll, uh, I understand the charter allows you to place liens that we hopefully get approved soon. Then from there, it goes to the city attorney, and they then try to prosecute if possible. And I think the last step, if I understand it, is that we sell the debt. And then at that point, I guess the final step is that we bring it, you either send it to the board or here, and we basically take it off the books. Is that kind of the process? Your understanding is correct, and I appreciate your observations uh, in, in that regard. Uh, you made a comment about whether or not we had our, our hands around that. Uh, I think there's been constant improvement of that uh, over the years, and there was uh, uh, one of the issues in, a, in an audit a few years ago was that we could not uh, determine the amount of receivables at any given time. And, and since that point, uh, we've enacted quarterly reporting and a number of other uh, monitoring devices where we now feel uh, we are much, much better situation in terms of monitoring those receivables. In terms of those items that are as, as much as 10 years old, you are correct. Uh, we have pushed departments to make sure they forward those uh, to collection agencies and or for write-off in a timely manner. Um, hasn't always been done in the past, but uh, as I said, uh, much more in terms of compliance. Uh, due to the quarterly reports, uh, we're, we're much more on top of that. And, and pushing departments to cooperate with that request. Okay. Let, let, let me ask you a, a side question. We pulled the, f uh, you sent out the issue about the number of uh, major tax delinquent people in the city. We pull that sheet out. Most of them, probably six of the top ten, are parking revenue tax of some type. And some of them are significant. I mean, the very top one is uh, prestige is 70 some million dollars and then you have crystal enterprises about almost eight million are those just hovering somewhere there those in the, in the legal system what's going on on those large numbers and particularly when we highlight them as being uh, that they're not paying their taxes I mean w where are they in the process um, understand of course the one at the top uh, that you indicated 70 some odd million mm -hmm. uh, much of that figure is based on estimated assessments However, uh, they have concluded a criminal case against uh, that individual. Uh, they were awarded jail time, and we're in the process now of uh, uh, working out the actual collection of those fines. Um, so, yes, we are proceeding. Uh, we're working very closely with the LAPD Police uh, Commission Investigation Division uh, in making sure that we address those outstanding issues with parking uh, lot operators. And uh, so we are basically, in essence, moving forward with either revocation proceedings through the, uh, through the police permit panel um, or asking them literally to go out and close down lots that are operating without a permit. Do we have the ability, as they've done in the past, where you actually can go operate the lot and collect the money? Like, uh, I mean, years ago, they used to do that in a business. You walk in and the guy standing at the cash register collecting the the state money because the business isn't paying it? Do we have that ability? That dis we've had that discussion. My understanding is is yes, but in terms of the, the logistics of actually uh, doing something like that, I, I couldn't comment. It's over time. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do that. Can't do that. Okay. Let, let me just ask one thing. You got any questions on that? Let me just ask Ray. I think what we need, uh, and because we've been asking about this for a while, I don't think that, uh, at least from my perspective, that there's a clear understanding of all these pieces in the in the collection of, of uh, our debt. Uh, it, I think we have departments still believing it's optional that they even work with uh, finance. And so we waste time there. And then once finance gets it, it goes to the primary and then the secondary. And 
So you get these things, and, I, and again, we keep uh, we either uh, basically moving forward on things that are eight or ten years old, and and then uh, are longer. What what I'd like to see if the CAO working with the CLA could create for us a, uh, for lack of a better term, a financial policy dealing with collection of debt, and in there give us some some criteria and in, uh, in the sense of identifying for. <laughs> city departments, uh, the steps to be taken, and, and that we put it in bold type that what's the responsibility of the department and to be timely in collecting the debt, and the other issues, what's the timeliness for referral to Office of Finance, uh, what's the timeliness uh, for us to refer to collection agencies, uh, and, and, and then uh, the timeliness to go to the city attorney's office and then to sell the debt and then coming to the board of review and then to the council. But we need to set something up to where it just seems as though uh, departments are ignoring them. They can't go before with the mechanisms we put in place without the department's help, and we have literally millions of dollars that is just languishing. Uh, I think we have a motion that's coming forward to ask what's going on in the city attorney's office because we hear t uh, figures somewhere in the neighborhood of multi-million dollars that's languishing in those cases that have been filed and time is passing. And, you know, we get so many of these that say that statute have run and we're out of the money. So we just keep going through that same cycle. And I think this, you will talk about it in another deal, but these uh, habitual folks that won't pay their bills, it just appears that uh, there's got to be something other than, you know, on the criminal side is one thing, but that doesn't necessarily bring in the revenue. That sends them to jail, and the guy still owes us $72.7 million. So we have to figure out uh, how do we get our hands on the revenue that's due us, because often we're talking about raising fees and all that other stuff, but yet we're not collecting the money that's coming in. Maybe what I might suggest is is we convene a meeting with um, finance and CLA and maybe your office because there is an executive directive uh, regarding collection and and finances. I think the policy you first drafted back in 2002, I want to say it, it's been a number of years, but some departments are better at following those guidelines than others. But I, but I think uh, one of the things that we, <clears throat> since that has come in place, we've had a number of things added, like we just recently are adding more collection companies. We've recently added selling the debt. And those are things I think has, you know, I think what's happened, so much of this stuff is disjointed. Mm. And no one can go to one single piece of paper or an area and say, here's the whole gamut of requirements. And I think that's where we keep falling short. And, and then our people from, what is it, Biker comes in and they pound us once a year for not collecting the mm -hmm. money. And in, in many instances, they're right. I mean, the money's just out there that we're not getting to. So if we can ask you to do that, we'll move this item to council, but we just need to address it. I would just say, I don't know if internally we even need to put more teeth into it in that maybe after going through that process, we make it clear departments that don't actually follow these guidelines face some <coughs> disciplinary response by by uh, general managers that well, I and, think that's one of the dilemmas I think what we run across is most of the stuff it's presented out here and all we can do at the very end is ask the mayors the mayor to basically take make these general managers accountable if they are not account we, we can't go in there and capture them that's the problem we, we end up putting a lot of these rules in place but they just kind of dissipate uh, perhaps we need to work more closely with the mayor to make sure there's actually uh, a real penalty to folks that don't do this because there's there's too much money involved uh, and, and the practices are still not strong enough. Uh, and Mr. So we can add that in the sense of talking how the mayor's office is involved in those kinds of issues. Mr. Parks, I will just say that there uh, are a set of guidelines called the citywide guidelines that are available online for departments to review. But just as you alluded to, our approach to collections is multi-pronged because we have the Office of Finance, the Department, the City Attorney, et cetera. So it sometimes is, is uh, uh, tricky to get all entities to work closely together. So um, I, I think uh, speaking with the CAO, we, we should address that.
it will be less tricky. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll move that item to the council, but I asked you to come back to us in, uh, what is that, uh, summer study or? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> We'll ask you what first of the year, first quarter of next year sometime. Yeah. 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 Right. So we'll ask for that to come back in some standard guidelines. Okay, next item. Okay, uh, next item is item 11. <coughs> Excuse me, this is Los Angeles Police Department report relative to a strategy for providing officer involved shooting data in correlation with the claims data in the Teams 2 system. <coughs> Let me just ask, uh, yes. this is so dated. I mean, we're trying to yes. pull back. It seems like when we were here before and we were asking Nine. to see how you could get this done, Nine. and the report kind of says here's some options, but if you can, I don't know if you were here, Stu, but it seems like we were even talking about the potential of a source of funds because this is a major, would be a major impact on our litigation and tracking that we can merge these things, that the city attorney could use it, you guys can use it. So, but when you look at the date on it, it's back to December of 2007, and we're saying we can't pull it up to figure out where we were going with it. But I thought there was, we at one time were talking about uh, how we could find a way to finance it. I, I was not here for, for that discussion, um, but I can say I think nothing has been done on this item. Uh, since that time, mm -hmm. and I think the the options were provided, and I think the department was waiting for direction from the council. Let me ask you, because you've given us two options, you could either do it what ITA, right? And um, Maggie um, Goodrich with the LAPD, we can either do it through um, ITA providing programmer resources, or we could use um, the vendor Sierra Systems who's built the um, use of force application and RMIS, the other team's applications, um, to, to build something for us. Um, even if we go the ITA route and have staffing on um, from their department build something for us, it would still require some engagement of Sierra because they'd have to actually build that link in to Teams 2. Um, it would be it would be probably considerably um, less and than if they Sierra built it all. Sierra is hard dollars. We have to give them money to do it. But on ITA, there's, there's personnel resources we'd be Mm -hmm. the, the last I spoke with ITA because of their lack of resources at the moment um, and the fact that they're uh, losing people on a, on a regular basis and furloughs and all of that, um, it didn't sound like they had staff available immediately to, to start on something like this. So we'd have to meet with them and go over that. Let me ask you, Ray, on sources of funds, uh -huh. would, would any of the funds in our uh, any of our litigation account be accessible to, because this is really a, issue of trying to create something that uh, addresses litigation and mm -hmm. gives us more information that may help us in the long term of cutting down our liabilities. And, and what we have is two systems that don't speak to each other. And so we're, every time we ask them this information, they have to go through a hand sword or something. And, and it should be readily available that you have the teens operation that's running full speed that's the state of the art, but yet we can't get to this type of information that's in the city attorney's office. It just seems like it's a, a loop that we should cover and figure out where mm -hmm. we can find, whether it's the litigation account or something. Well, unfortunately, given sort of the, the state of the budget, um, there isn't a whole lot of money available funds. I mean, and certainly we're, we it think we're going to be short. Seven. Yeah, in litigation. <clears throat> yes, it was another time. But I, I think we should certainly ask ITA to, to weigh in whether they do have the resources. I suspect they do not, given the furloughs and uh, retirees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I would suspect our option actually is to go to Sierra and perhaps we can ask them for a, a what else is Sierra doing for us? Are they, is this the last part of Teams? They um, just finished the redesign of the use of force system. As you recall, when I came on a, a few years ago, that system was really um, not usable or user friendly. So they just finished that. And then um, basically they're doing uh, maintenance on RMIS to make sure that we maintain the requirements of the uh, transition agreement with the Department of Justice. Have we talked to them about 
any of their efforts to help us on this project? Not since I um, wrote that report, which was submitted uh, in 2008. We should we should ask, and at least we can get a quote, and we can assess how we can. Well, let's just, we'll, we'll hold this till uh, January and see if we can ask you to come back. But it just seems like it's in, the, in this whole spectrum of litigation. It's not a lot of money. It's just that we don't have any money at the time. So if we can talk to uh, them and see if they could do this as part of an existing project, because I think it would give a, uh, we shouldn't be hand tallying stuff that deals with our litigation in, in 2010. So if we could do that, we'll hold it here in January. We'll ask, work with the CAO and with Sierra and see if we can find some way to implement this issue as far as the technology doing it for us. Sure. All right. So we'll hold item 11 here. Okay, good. I think just for a clarification, item number nine was approved on consent. Nine? I guess. I think I had it down as consent, but I just wanted yes, to. Yes, that was on consent. Six, five, six, seven, seven, nine, ten, and twelve. Perfect. All right, that should conclude today's yes. meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much.